get in from the track that night and you, you go down to the Flying Dutchman to the bar and me, I remember going in there one night and he's just laid out on the on the dance floor like he's out cold out, <laughs> and, and the party's going on around him or whatever like they, they, he must be fine or whatever I'm like what's he doing laying on the floor and you know it's did just, he have to race the next day oh yeah and he'd, <laughs> and he'd do it well hey I'm Mike Kermit Jr. and you're watching the Derek Person <laughs> This is going to suck. Hey, this is Mike Kermit Jr., and you're watching the Derek Perna Siglio Show. Can I drive you? Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the show. And, boy, we have got a great guest that's going to join us. He's a former driver. He's also a spotter to the stars. Mike Herman Jr., how you doing, man? Thanks, Derek. Thanks for having me on, man. So- Good day out. We're glad you could uh, put down the, the the rake and the lawn mowing equipment to come on and join us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Trying to get some yard work done when you when you travel to Cup Series, you try to sneak in a little work ever around but, the house when you can. Well, this will just be fun because all we're going to do is just talk and trade war stories and and, and all of that. What we want to do is we want to get the viewers and the listeners kind of familiar with who you are. You were a former driver, uh, track champion at Concord Motorsport Park. Uh, how many, what'd you win? Three or four? Two, two in a row, 97, 98. Two in a row, 90. And that was at the height of the it late was. model stock. Yeah, I mean, I guess at the time we probably didn't know it, but now going back and looking at it, uh, it was at the height of late model stock car racing, you know, and I was just coming off of, you know, a couple of years racing at Hickory Motor Speedway against the likes of Max Presswood Jr. and Dennis Setzer and, and guys like that. And then, uh, uh, you know, what it looks like today is a little bit differently than, than what it was back then. So I guess it was right at the height of it. Yeah, right. and you, like, you traded fenders with some of the best that have gone on to, to nat racing prominence, guys like Jack Sprague and Hornaday, right? Didn't you race with those guys? A yeah, bit those too? those guys. You know, they come through Concord as Big Ten guys with the super okay. late model. So you know, I was a NASCAR late model stock car guy. Um, you know, my formative years was cut at Hickory Motor Speedway. Would have been my home track then. Started running limited, and uh, I guess that would have been '93. Run limited in '94. Started making some late model stock car starts, and then uh, was a rookie in 1995 at Hickory. Uh, you know, so like guys like Dennis Setzer and. Uh, Barry, uh, excuse me, uh, Max Presswood and uh, Andy Houston, Scott Kilby, guys like that were were running Hickory full time at the at the time. So uh, that's back when Concord was still pretty much super late models, and then uh, Henry Fur decided to bring in late model stock cars, and um, you know started trying to get more of a weekly following at Concord instead of a you know kind of a once a month type thing. The way the Big Ten series was was set up, you know, so. Uh, late mall stock car racing at the time was was new and it was kind of a, a lot of guys from different tracks kind of merged in to, to run concord and some guys uh switched over from supers and started running late mile stock cars so it was a it was a it was a pretty uh, uh tough field of cars back then you know with guys like clay rogers running and lance balls chad mullis obviously it's well documented that those were my main rivals we uh uh i felt like we were entertaining to to watch and uh you know uh, we had good crowds back then is that around the time when like rodney childers was also racing uh, late model stocks yeah too? he was he would run tri-county on friday night then um you know he'd come crew chief clayton on uh on saturday so uh, uh rodney run friday nights and clay would run saturdays at, at concord so it was uh it was a eclectic mix of uh guys back then you know, we had uh, we had Freddie Query on the show uh, last season, just talking about how Concord was, and he said, you know, it it scared people. It, it it drove them away. They didn't want to run there. It did. It was a tough racetrack, and I mean, like, it's a shame that we don't have it anymore because uh, a, a track that was that unique, uh, it really built your skill set, you know. And I mean, every every short track, they say, hey, you know, if you can run here, you can run anywhere. And I mean, like it was the truth at Concord, though. I mean, it was it was a mix between a short track and a super speedway. I mean, because right. you, you know, uh, you'd run through the dog leg wide open, and uh, the way you each end of the racetrack was different, and it, it really honestly felt like a you know a roller coaster. You know, you would kind of climb your way up out of turn one, uh, then you'd fall your way back into the dog leg, and then kind of climb back into three. You'd fall back down into the center of turn three, and uh, um, there wasn't a turn four. Right, it was three corners. Yeah, it was three corners. You know, so uh, but uh, but the 
third corner, turn four, yeah. what people would know, it jumped up at you fast if it you would. hit it wrong. Yeah, because like you're carrying so much speed, you know, through that corner, and and it would tighten up, you know, and flatten out coming, you know, onto the front straightaway, and you'd kind of lug the motor down the front straightaway because you couldn't gear it for both ends. I mean, you know, the back straightaway was so long with the dog leg being wide open that you'd kind of have to lug through uh, down the front straightaway just to, you know, to make speed down the back. So, uh, man, it was a, it was, it was a unique racetrack. And I mean, obviously going on to travel with the Hooters Pro Cup Series, I got to run a lot of short tracks, but none of them were like Concord. I ran one race at Concord. It was in a street stock. It was 2007. And in the street stock, I felt like I was flying. So I couldn't imagine what it was like in a late model or a super late model or, or even a modified. Yeah. And I tell you when it, uh, uh, you know, when I first run the Pro Cup car there, that's when, I mean, you had to drive, like a late mile stock car, you know, back then we were still 352 barrel carburetors and uh, uh, so not making a ton of horsepower, you know, 350 plus, uh, you know, so it was kind of more of a momentum type game, you know, uh, uh, but when you go out there in a Pro Cup car, you know, which at the time, you know, the Pro Cup series hadn't really evolved yet, so it really was just a Bush car, you know, with a Pro Cup engine in it, uh, which made so 650, I think, somewhere around somewhere 600, 650 horsepower. Which is more than what the cup cars have today. Today, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, you were manhandling the car. It did not want to go through the dog like, wide open. You know, you you literally had to drive, you know, uh, through there as well as the rest of the racetrack. That's when you realize how bad this racetrack is. And it's sitting here, it's surreal to think about it now, you know, because we're sitting here talking like we could go to a race there this weekend and now it's gone. I know. I, I've, I went through it after they tore it down and just looking around, you 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 almost want to shed a tear because like you, you, I look up on the top of the hill where the tower used to be and I was like, that's that's where I, yeah, I, I, didn't I called go. so many races from there. Yeah, and I never went. Uh, once I knew that it was going to be gone, I never went back over there. I mean, I did have one last crazy idea because I heard, you know, dudes went over there and the gate was open and he sent me a video of riding around the racetrack and I'm like, you know, I need to call out and Boyd up and a couple of these other guys and just tell them, look, we're having a street stock race. One o'clock, <laughs> drive the car in, be in your suits. The gates are open. When we get on the racetrack, we're coming to the green and just have one more show, you know, and uh, that would have been wild. But, uh, you know, it's uh, it's just yeah. surreal to really I, think about it. You'd never recognize the place now. I actually saw a picture that somebody sent me of what it looks like now, and it's just uh, uh it, it bring a tear to your eye but it's so funny too because i have this right here this is one of the railings at victory lane from concord yep. that's yep. <laughs> that's one of the yeah. small pieces i've got and i also have in uh actually in the shed at my place i've got the last two s rows of seating so yep. i've got the grandstand two pieces of the grandstands from uh from concord so. yeah that's awesome uh you know well, that's memories like that's all we're gonna have left well what, what do you get what you got to do is come on over one day and we'll put two of them together because they come they come apart in pieces so yeah. we'll put two of them together and you put it up in the short track hall of fame yeah well, i appreciate that you <laughs> that's the I mean? other thing tell everybody uh, about the short track hall of fame yeah me and matt dillner we just uh <laughs> Uh, looks face to facts, you know what I mean? Like I've had a long career, he's had a long career. A lot of people have influenced us and uh, a lot of our influencers will never sniff the Hall of Fame of any kind, you know what I mean? And I'll never be in the Hall of Fame of Me any neither. kind. And, you know, it's for, you know, it's for guys like us and the guys that, that influenced us, you know, that uh, uh, because like, you know, of course, going back to when I was a kid, I mean, I guess 1970, nine really would have been my first i was born in 74 so 79 i started you know i remember things about racing in 79 when earnhardt was you know uh running for the rookie of the year and um you know 80 81 is really formidable years for me but there's been so many people that you know you mentioned one of them a minute ago and freddie query i mean yeah. he's, a, he's a member of the short track hall of fame at my house he because <laughs> i mean you know his driving style and and his demeanor and and the way he carried himself at the racetrack you know, outside of guys like Earnhardt and Sam Ard, you know, I looked up to Freddie. Still do to this day, you know, and he can still uh, win races too. Oh, I absolutely, totally believe you know, that. Yeah, he's a uh, he's racing go karts. He's back to yeah, <laughs> playing mean, with go karts with Jack Sprague. Yeah, I mean, it'd be fun to race with in anything, you know, because uh, Freddie was. Uh, I mean, he's an all time great. He's one of the best short track racers that's ever been. He doesn't. Uh, he gets a lot of credit, but he doesn't get the credit he deserves. You know, I mean, he's really, really good. He he. 
he had the ability to to make it even further than short track racing it's just it goes to show you in this sport here it's not meant to be you know uh for everybody i mean the cards have to fall your way and get the right opportunities and the exact same way i ended up being a spotter i mean i never intended to be a spotter you know what i mean how did it happen uh ran out of funding went away and uh 2008 was my last year behind the wheel and that was a part-time year i guess 07 was my last fully funded year with fireside hearth and home um you know it's well documented that the housing bubble busted you know during that time and uh you know the economy was in a bad shape and the subprime mortgages yeah, yeah when fireside started sponsoring me which was thorman eastern at the time they were basically an office of three or four people in charlotte and then i watched it grow and and uh help be part of that through our promotions and i saw the business continue to grow uh housing was exploding in in charlotte and when i first started um running late mile stock car you know my cars were built out of metal crafters uh they were townsend chassis and uh mark davis's shop at metal crafters was up by big daddy's on 150 i used to get there from my house and 20 25 minutes yeah, you know, good luck now it's just all farmland <laughs> there there wasn't nothing that whole stretch you know through mooresville there was you know hardly anything except for downtown and a few stores and big daddies and stuff like that that was it and now I'll look at it but during that whole time you know as it exploded uh Bowman eastern grew more and more people you know working and I'll never forget over at the office over there, they had a wall of, if you worked there, you had a picture on the wall. And I remember the first day that I went in there that there was kind of a highlight shadow where pictures had come off the wall. Oh, really? And as I started seeing pictures come off the wall, I knew that my time was limited, that our program would be cut, you yeah. know, and, and it did. And so that's, um, you know how i transitioned over but you know my longtime spotter chris lambert at spots for the 11 cup car now he had you know worked a system through my team to get opportunities spotting uh and i had guys that had worked on my short track team that were uh, uh working together at, at higher levels and and so i just kind of networked through there and you know so that's what I, I need to try to at least hedge my bets at the time i didn't know that that's what i would end up doing you know for the next 15 years as a career it's kind of hedging my bet um that i knew that hey i can do this uh it's growing um and then it just kind of went from there and next thing you know you're no longer a driver you know i mean you know i, I never i tell people all the time i never said i retired you know what i mean <laughs> technically right. forgot what movie it was i basically just lost my ride you know yeah i never never retired just yep. lost my ride. but yep. you've you've spotted for some really big names just recently won a talladega congratulations yeah, I appreciate uh, that. on that with jeb burton yep. so but i mean you've won with well burton uh martin truex uh who else have you yeah uh, stan house we want to you know when obviously ricky was a, a long time driver of mine uh you know he was the reason why i'm at, at uh rfk now he uh um in 13 i was spotting for truex on a 56 napa car and that's well documented that that went away with uh everything that happened that year when napa pulled out and uh um our team was going to disband you know and and just kind of and i was new i mean i'd only been in full-time cup for that one year now i'd spotted cup races for like tony reigns and you know a couple other people but you know i, I hadn't broke my way into being a you know a full-time full -time guy you know mm -hmm. and um you know back to being such a like that concord connection you know like rodney childers was the reason why that i ended up at mwr you know i had done some practice sessions for him when he was uh over there and their spotter couldn't be there and um he just you know he knew that i was hustling he knew i was doing a ton of short track races that's when i was uh uh on the knn east team with uh jgr with mark davis uh was spotting for ryan priest on a modified tour up north and uh, just doing a ton of races you know and um you know when that opportunity when that position come open rodney fortunately thought about me and you know because a lot of times you know it, it comes from within on the roof you know guys that just move around it's very seldom that you know new guys get opportunities and uh fortunate that i did and then when that went away uh stenhouse was looking to do something different and um you know he contacted me and next thing you know i end up at rfk in 14 and have been there ever since spotters are kind of weird in their job duty because you never see them 
stay with one team or sometimes they will stay with one team there's a lot of like free agency going on with that how come spotters just don't have ones that just work for the team you know i i guess that's because of just relationships with your drivers um you know i've been with rfk now on the 17 for 10 years and uh, i guess looking around and looking at the guys that's on the 17 now i guess you know it just uh kind of an eye-opener you say well man i guess i'm the longest tenured guy on the 17 you know and uh but that was unique when when ricky moved to jtg um and they brought chris back uh with boucher you know i'd already worked with him in the xfinity series at, at rfk so that was kind of a um you know there wasn't any you know wondering how i mean we'd already worked together so it was just it was no transition or anything like that and um you know, it's RK. also it's also about trust too, because the driver he he works with a spotter, he likes him, and he stays with him for for a while. Yeah, you know, we've seen that with a lot of guys like Freddie Kraft and Bubba come to mind. I mean, he was with Bubba since the K and N days. Yeah, well, it's just like with Ricky. I never, um, neither one of us anticipated, you know, um, him moving on from from there, and and. Obviously, I had the opportunity to go with him and would have loved to have stayed with Ricky throughout his, I mean, entire career. I loved working with, with Stenhouse. I mean, we won cup races together uh, at Talladega and Daytona and, you know, and that kind of thing. It's just that, you know, sometimes business gets in the way of things like that. And, you know, I um, had kind of dug in deep at, at, at Roush and, you know, it's a, it's a home for me and, um, you know, never really, I didn't anticipate that I would be at one cup team for, for that long because you do see a lot of other guys move around. But there is a handful of guys up there that's been, you know, on the same team and, and that kind of thing with the, um, you know, with different drivers for a long time. You do see it some, but, yeah, it's a lot of bouncing around. For for a short track guy like yourself, uh, obviously being a, a racer, you know, you dream of going to the big time and everything, but you went there uh, as a spotter you know, and – made it to daytona victory lane i mean that's gotta that's gotta be huge for you it is yeah i mean you know i don't know i it, it, sometimes it doesn't feel the same no it doesn't feel the same it, it then you know uh winning yourself and that kind of thing even though you know you're a huge part of it but you know when you're there's so many people that's involved whether it's in cup or xfinity level or you know truck or anything like that that, that we're all just little pieces of the puzzle uh you know and i've never you know uh i'm just there to help guide my guide my driver to be the best you know that they can be on the racetrack and the ultimate goal is to win uh but all of us lose way more than we ever win that's one thing that's humbling about racing you know it's oh, yeah, uh, yeah. you know if you win one a year sometimes that's good and they they i know guys on the roof did uh have been trying to win a race forever and have never even won one so you never take it for granted but i don't know i guess i race so much you know with with my line of work i I probably take the green flag as a spotter 125 times a year on mm -hmm. average. And that's I, across all three national series? All three national series and short track stuff, mm -hmm. um, you know, because uh, I still do a lot of that. Uh, I have been scaling back some as a, as a as what we do in Cup has become more extensive. I spend way more time at the shop now. I spend way more time uh preparing for races and preparing things for chris to, to help him for the weekend I, I i spent a ton of time on restarts and smt review and a lot of things that we didn't used to have to do you like know? what what are some of those things you work on during the week are you are you watching old videos are you watching the broadcast again what's, uh, what's going on all the above you know you you go back and watch the uh the broadcast uh, uh of the race uh, you'll go pick out video clips and things like that that might be useful uh, to, for, to go back and review. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of SMT, we, you know, it's probably we spend more time on SMT than, than anything. My focus is primarily usually on restarts, mm -hmm. uh, choose rule, things like that to try to uh, uh, make our plan for the weekend and, and to just try to make sure that we're being positive on restarts and, and gaining spots or at least holding position and that kind of thing because there's a lot of race craft that goes into that now and um there's a lot of things that are predictable you know and so the stuff that's predictable you, you got to get ahead of it so that way you can expect it so i spend most of my time on that you know you're like me in the sense that you come from a racing family it, um you've been around cup racing all of your life where i have not and yeah. you know your dad was a crew crew member for dale earnhardt right yeah yep on his uh on the bush car late mile sportsman in in the beginning you know the the car that ran out of the family shop in Canapolis. so that was 
76 to 86 so that's uh, the number the, the orange and the, white number eight yeah no that yeah the eight car which it you know in my first recollection starting in you know 79 80 81 would have been uh, already like a blue and yellow wrangler car you okay. know yeah and then the last year in 86 was the uh first year a lot of people don't realize this but uh good wrench went on the bush car mm-hmm. first before it transitioned and i think in 88 to the to the cup car so um that's one thing that I do have. It's unique because I got all my dad's uniforms left over and all his hats from the from the Earnhardt days. But you know, one of the it's nothing special to look at because it really was just patches thrown on a on a polo shirt. On a but, shirt. but it was the very first good wrench uniform uh, that there ever was. You know, so that's that's pretty cool. You know. So he did fabricating or chassis building back then. The guys just did everything. They did everything. You know, right? yeah. You know, my dad uh, <coughs> um, basically tutored under jake elder and robert g you know and uh obviously you know g was the master fabricator and uh just all around car builder and then obviously jake was the master mechanic and and setup guy you know so uh really those days back then it was like earnhardt's friends from Canapolis that 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 worked on the car no different than your buddies working on your late mile stock car or something like what i had so they did a little bit of everything but uh you know the over the wall stuff you know they just the, the guys that worked on the car at the shop you know just went over the wall you know yeah. and he would either carry tires or catch can you know things like that and then sometimes they would uh have the cup crew come and do it you know what i mean if those guys did it then you know a guy like my dad might just hold a sign that day or or whatever they just did whatever it took you know but i guess back during during the week when they would get ready for these races because they didn't run a lot i mean they only run you know seven eight nine races a year which they'd run charlotte darlington you know rockingham you know those the local races you know and but during the course of the year they're running like hickory and south boston and all that isn't the, the well the sport, like wasn't that what the sportsman well, you series know, was doing so in like 79 and 80 um dale was already run cup full-time then you know so uh my first recollection was during that time you Mm -hmm. know what i mean so like 76 77 78 i'd have to go back and pick my dad's brains but yeah it would have been hickory and caraway you know um you know i think metrolina when it was asphalt stuff like that you know you know i I was talking with matt dillner before uh you got here you know i told him that he you were coming on the show and he was all excited and everything Mm -hmm. he said you gotta ask uh herm about his robert g impression and his favorite quote from robert g so <laughs> this is uh this this will be interesting but i mean i have never met robert g i don't know him or anything like that i mean i've seen the cars that he built over the years i heard yeah. he was a beautiful uh, fabricator and just master mechanic he was and he liked chrome uh he wanted you know that's one thing that even as a young kid i just you could tell anytime robert g you were around his stuff that like his stuff was immaculate you know like uh picture jimmy blewett's modifieds now you know showtime. No, yeah showtime is like his stuff I, I, you know it's pristine you can eat off of it <laughs> man showtime's great on social too you know with his instagram and, oh my god and, he's so funny you know you never you never see this stuff getting worked on but obviously i know how much work it goes in to just get these things to the racetrack and then to turn around and you know make it look Tim Brown's like the same way at the stadium. You know, his stuff is always immaculate, and that's a testament to him and his brother Ben. It's like, you know, but that's the way Robert G was. So, you know, guys like Tim Brown and and Showtime kind of, they have a little bit of Robert G in them, you know, and and so G liked his stuff to look good, and he liked Chrome, and he had a, he had a saying. <laughs> he said, "If the motherfucker don't run Chrome, it you know what I mean." <laughs> yeah, so. The, so in other words, if, if it wasn't fast, you can, it leave, you can look good, you know, but it didn't matter. Robert G's stuff was always fast. He was cutting edge. You know, he uh, he was ahead of the arrow game. Uh, him and guys like Jake Elder, they didn't know what they, exactly why things had worked, but you could just see back then they were already ahead of it. But what kind of – any interesting stories about him or, or life in the shop with, with those guys or being around them? You know, when I was a kid, you know, uh, getting to go to – you know, I didn't get to go over to G's – a lot but i remember a lot of times like my dad would need to pick up something or whatever and i'd get to go over there so that was like i don't know like going to a national park getting to go somewhere different because back then driving 15 20 minutes from canapolis over to charlotte motor speedway that was like you know going to the big time you go by the big track and then pull over to to g's house and just know that you were you know you're in a different environment over there than you were at the uh 
at Earnhardt's family shop over in Kannapolis, you know, but uh, getting to go and, you know, on those summer nights, Earnhardt had a, um, uh, like a barber chair in, in the shop and that's where I would sit and I would just sit and, uh, just watch, you know what I mean? And, uh, you know, you wish you had like video or something like that now, because the older you get, the memories kind of fade away. But I just remember, you know, them guys just worked. You know what I mean? They so were you'd just watch Dale come over and just start turning wrenches. Just turning wrenches. You really? know what I mean? Getting ready to race. I mean, you know, and uh, I'd get to go and stay for a couple of hours, and um, I guess I was well behaved because I mean I got to continue to go back, and I remember I'd go in the office in there and sit in the chair and just kind of play like I was in charge, you know, like I was, you know, sitting in the office doing work myself and um like what and, a what a privilege like think about that. You're a kid and Dale Earnhardt is overworking in the shop where you're just sitting there hanging out. Yeah. I, I mean for any kid nowadays that would be like being able to sit down with Kyle Larson or or Tony Stewart in the garage or at Harvick while they're working on their car getting it ready. Yeah, you know, it's just even, amazing. I knew like the very first time I got to go to Victory Lane, and I think it was at Rockingham, and I remember standing. And I've told this story a thousand times, but like, well, tell yeah, tell yeah. it here, man. Well, <laughs> I was I was probably eight years old, seven maybe seven or eight years old. The very first time I got to go to Victory Lane, and I remember. Um, running up to victor lane thinking there's no way like they're going to let me in you know what i mean and and like i remember i had a um you know i didn't have the exact crew shirt but they had made me a shirt it was yellow with wrangler on it and and you know so i kind of fit in and like yeah come on come on you know so i get to go in there and then next thing you know you're you know kneeling there for pictures and you know when you look over like this and you see earnhardt standing there holding the trophy it's like you didn't see earnhardt you saw superman standing right there. And then you just, I don't know, it just you just realize this is what you're going to do. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, this is what, this is your path. You know, and I didn't know what my path, I wanted to be a race car driver. You know, and uh, uh, my dad raced. He was a flat track motorcycle racer in his 60s. And that was kind of how he, you know, got in. Of course, Kannapolis was a small town then, but my dad raced flat track bikes. And because flat track motorcycles was kind of big in our area which also takes a lot of balls too yeah 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 i mean it's watching those guys nowadays they're crazy but (laughs) i guess that's the reason why my dad you know never which flat track kind of phased out around here you know the couple Mm -hmm. tracks that run them went away and you know so that was a different path and stock car racing got to be big but i remember dad telling me that he was wanting to uh port ahead on a on an engine and um the only person he knew in town that would know how to do it or guide him would have been Ralph Earnhardt. And he said, I, he remembered he took the, you know, initiative to finally go over there, you know, and, and went in and he said, Ralph he said, he never even looked up, you know what I mean? He was busy, didn't even acknowledge me. So I left, but he said, you know, I, I, I wanted to learn how to do this so bad that I, I decided I'd go back. And he said, next time I went back, uh, Ralph said something along the lines, I got I got a little bit more time to to help you what what you need and and Ralph uh my dad told Ralph that hey I want to learn how to port this head, you know, and um he said he kind of felt like that Ralph kind of took him in then because he wanted to learn how to do it. He didn't want him to do it for him, you know, so uh, you know, they kind of hit it off there and then that was when, you know, Dale was coming along and so I guess he would have went with uh, with Dale to, to help him out some. And then next thing you know, he just, you know, started going with them a, a quite a bit. And my dad was a police officer in town, too. So he didn't get to go to all the races because, I mean, you know, he's a police officer. He has a full-time job. And, right. uh, you know, that had to come first. But he would try to work his schedule around, you know, racing and, and that kind of thing. But So uh, your dad actually worked on Ralph Earnhardt's cars before Dale Earnhardt. He didn't actually. I don't think he ever actually helped with Ralph on his cars. He just got to know Ralph through Ralph helping him on his flat track bike. And uh, uh, dad's best <laughs> friend was, you know, Ronnie Smith that was one of the best flat track guys in, in North Carolina and, and done good in that national events and stuff like that too and uh you know so there was a little bit of connection through those guys and and so um you know they were kind of good at what they did over here on the two-wheel stuff and so somehow another connection was formed there and you know pop wanted to go uh stock car racing too so he he went with them and started helping them out so your driving career started what in go karts? Go karts, nineteen eighty three. So in nineteen eighty three, you started racing go karts. And from yeah. what I heard, 
I think I heard it on Junior's podcast, is that you guys sold him his very first go-kart. Yeah, I guess probably 80, probably 85 or something like that. Me and Dale Jr. obviously grew up, at, you know, if I'm over there hanging out, he was too. So we were we were friends and, uh, you know, when they were living in the area and, um, you know, he, I guess, I don't know, they hadn't decided what kind of path with him, you know, and, and where I was already racing go-karts and, um I'm sure my dad and Dale talked about it and that kind of thing. So I'm pretty sure the very first time he raced, I think it probably would have been just one of my carts or something like that. And um, and then they, you know, bought just their to own try stuff. It out. Yeah, just to try it okay. out. And then I don't. He didn't end up racing. It's hard for me to remember this stuff. I was eight, nine years old back then. But he uh, he didn't end up racing a lot. I remember he. I think he got upside down. It. We were in Cameron. I think it was D and K was the name of this track. I remember Dale come running across the track and, and because we were, I, we were kind of racing back to the yellow and I didn't know who had wrecked. You know what I mean? Here comes Dale running across the track. So obviously it was Dale Jr. And luckily nobody ran ran him oh, over. No. That would have changed the sport. But, um, you know, and then I don't I don't think Dale liked go-kart racing. You know, I don't. No cage. No cage, things like that. So that put Dale Jr. back on the sidelines and I, I continued on uh racing go-karts and our pass really didn't cross again until late mile stock car stuff around myrtle beach and places like that you know but you were a terror in the go-karts though i mean you won race after race in wka championships didn't you yeah um you know i I run carts for 10 years and it was it was a tough deal for me because like i was oversized you know what i mean it's you know like um i think rookie, you got to be small to race yeah cars, rookie box know. stop back then i think mm-hmm. it was 225 and like it needed to be like 245 for me and then i think junior stock was 265 it probably needed to be 285 so i was always <laughs> a little on the heavier side but once i got into the uh uh junior limited where i had some motor that would pull me or whatever we started winning a lot of races and that was always my uh, still to this day like junior limited modified back then in 87 88 89 uh, that was the like the pinnacle for a young guy like me because man they, these things would just haul the mail you know right. just power to weight rate ratio and then went on from there to get to you know run open modified and um flathead and, motors yeah too, right? yeah, yeah, yeah flathead yeah. and we run you know on the opens we either run a flathead briggs or a honda you know so those things would scat so uh you know, cause I was in the era when we, they basically outlawed junior limited and made us start running junior super stock because of, uh, insurance reasons, because junior limited at the time, the only thing that was faster at the racetrack was probably unlimited two cycle. Um, you know, because our, our weight, the you know, we're small, you even know, though you're limited, you're yeah, lightweight. We were, yeah. We were as fast as the opens back then. Like <laughs> unlimited two cycle would be a little bit quicker, but you know, them guys were out of control. It, it was always back then it was amazed us because even back then in go-kart racing we were focused on handling and chassis you know and then you watch these unlimited two cycles and they're just out there like sideways and just tons of motor and you know and that kind of thing but yeah they they made us start running super stocks you know and then they started putting restrictor plate on junior box stock because when i run junior stock it was just like same engine as what the box stock like medium and heavy guys run just we were junior right then they started putting restrictor plates on them and and slowing them down and i'm like i just i couldn't fathom that stuff so junior limited's uh lost to history as well so you went from go-karts to late models yeah i run street stock at at hickory and tri-county just a handful of times um we didn't know nothing about it you know what i mean because right. like my dad coming from you know working on earnhardt's bush cars and stuff the street stock and you know metric chassis and all that kind of stuff was just like greek we didn't know what to really do to you know so we didn't we didn't do that very long till we got a uh uh bought a late mile stock car it was a car that um kirk shelmerdine had drove for um uh, applin boring um that he run sportsman for um so we bought that car as a manual zavakas car and we started running limited at, at hickory in 93 so run limited 93 94 and then built a new towns car to run late model stock car now did you your dad went to late model stocks because that was what he was familiar with. he was from, familiar with yeah, it, okay yeah. see so that's what you that's why you guys went yeah. that way okay and you guys raced together as a team for years yeah. right i have three championships at concord yeah, two, two two i'm sorry yeah. two championships at concord the only yeah. two times i attempted to run for points too so we won so i would hope to think we could have run one more than two if we would have hung around but you know i had to itch to 
to want to travel. I was trying to grow my sponsorship program as well. And then uh, Hooters Pro Cup Series was on the rise back then. So mm-hmm. that we kind of went into that path. And then what a lot of people don't know, too, is that you were also a star on a reality show, too. It was CMT's The Drive. So. Yeah, I don't know about star, but I was on a on a reality TV show back then. It's called yeah, CMT, um, The Drive. You know, How so did that, was that all it. come together? I just, um, I remember I got a phone call one night. And when I say phone call, I mean like on the landline, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, not a, not cell phone or ain't, not an email or anything like that. Called me on the phone and um, they had heard, basically I had uh, a sponsorship deal. And part of that sponsorship deal with this company was is they bought the hauler for me. And when that company decided to, to pull out from their agreement, they sent a fax to me. And so I learned by facts that this company was not going to, that they were basically terminating the agreement and they wasn't going to, wasn't going to continue on. So it basically put me sponsorless. Couldn't say without a ride because we owned the team, you know, it was, right. you know, it was our own family team. So it just didn't have money to go race. And so that, that story got out there somehow or another. Um, and then when CMT, the, the producers of that show or the writers of that show, however that worked, um, was looking for storylines they were looking at guys in the pro cup series you know I, th- I think that like they wasn't doing like nascar was too much red tape to, to do a show like right. that back then mm-hmm. so they were looking for the next best thing and uh, pro cup and i think that was asa national tour at the time there was some guys they they followed in that as well so they just liked that story and they called me up and talked and you know and then they let me in on what they were doing and and of course i was trying to you know get as much exposure as i could and you're figuring great for my sponsors next thing yeah next thing i know they showed up at the house with the whole whole production and and away they went (laughs) first time having cameras around and you're probably thinking what the hell is is happening here yeah it's you know it was uh i made a lot of good friends on that show um i wish the show would have lasted longer than than what it did but it was um it was kind of cutting edge at the time uh you know people remember like uh mbs 24 7 or whatever oh yeah it come along afterwards but it was in the same production style as what the drive was mm-hmm. um you know there were a uh, couple of those pretty decent shows that i liked uh, yeah. in that speed channel era. like they did uh men behind the wrenches remember that show yeah. i thought that was a great show yeah it, it didn't last very long but i thought it was cool yeah um <clears throat> what was nbs 24 7 was also good yeah I thought Madhouse was a very well done show when the History Channel had it going. And, yeah, and that, that, oh yeah, that's the other thing. You raced that at the Madhouse in the modified. What yeah. made you want to go? Okay, for years and years and years, uh, as a late model stock guy, made you want to go over to run a modified. Well, I mean, I have, number one, I wanted to be a professional race car driver. I wanted to make a living entertaining by driving race cars. You know, because mm-hmm. I always looked at myself that even if. I didn't win the race. I was still like a, a blue collar guy that that my fans I feel like connected with me through that as the sport changed. Uh, but I, I had a long history at Bowman Gray as a kid. Uh, Tim Jones, his dad was Pee Wee Jones, six time modified champion at Bowman Gray. Um, he helped me in my kart racing, and you know so uh, they were big into go kart racing too. So I got to know Pee Wee, and they had invited me up. To, to go to Bowman Gray one time and I remember going over there distinctly with Pee Wee when we walked in it's like anybody within arm's length of Pee Wee just got to walk right in like he was like a legend walking in and then getting into the stadium and people coming up and asking him for a picture or autograph you know that kind of thing and then um, so once we got there and then the the atmosphere there because it's so similar to what it is today, it was back then, which would have been probably 84, 85. A lot went on for me in 84, 85. <laughs> I would the, imagine that the crowd has always been the same. It's just the style of cars has changed. Yeah, you know, and even the <laughs> style of cars, they look similar to what they did back then. And, and uh, now in, in sportsmen and street, they didn't because back then they, they literally looked like 
street cars, you know, and now right. they just look like late models with the, you know, uh, the aftermarket, regular, aftermarket bodies. bodies I don't and stuff. like that. I know. I still love yeah. the old Chevelles and the Malibu bodies and, and yeah, the it's nostalgic. Logo. It's they're obviously were fun to watch and people got behind <laughs> them. But that's how I ended up going to Bowman Gray, and um, you know, we had talked about wanting to race at Bowman Gray, but a couple of things we had went. I remember going to Rodney Combs' shop and sitting in a super late model which would have been a late mile stock because Henry had a class called late mile stock. But it was basically an offset super late model with a late mile stock car engine in it. And we were going to do that. But we knew that if we did that, that that's the only place we could race that car was Concord. You know, there really, there wasn't any other track. It was unique. Right. So there was Bowman Gray, there was Concord, and then there was Hickory. And we knew that if we went to Hickory, you know, we could run Tri County, we could run Caraway, Orange County, Myrtle Beach, just as a pretty, late model star. As a late model star, we right. could go anywhere. Uh, NASCAR was really pushing it through the uh, Winston Racing Series at the time, so that's why we chose to to go that route. And you know, so I missed out on some things. Like to me, one of the biggest regrets. It's not really a regret, but like not being able to run a legitimate Big Ten Super Late Model race at Concord and having my name etched in as a winner alongside Freddie or being able to race with Freddie in that environment, I might not ever, I, I would like to have the opportunity to race with him. You know, he was so good, you know, that uh, maybe you don't beat him. But you don't, because I didn't get that opportunity. And then next thing you know, it, it goes away. So I didn't want that, the dream of Bowman Gray to go away either. So. I understand that. Yeah, so I that's can. how I ended up there. But it was a kind of an interesting story how that even come about because, when I was running the Pro Cup North Tour for, um, um, well, this was the year before I run Don Sprouse's car, or it might have been the year I was running Don Sprouse's car. Anyway, we're at Shemung, New York for a, a Pro Cup North race. Mm -hmm. And, um, that was we, such we, a great we, yeah, we, I love, yeah, I love Shemung too. But anyway, um, a guy come up to me after the race and he wanted to buy the motor out of the car. And, so we decided to sell the engine out of that car and they run modified at Shemung and on the ROC tour. So we just got to know Scott Parsons through through that and we just kind of hit it off and kept in touch. Well, his kid, Matt, was going to move down to Charlotte to go to UNC Charlotte. And Scott called up and said, hey, I need a favor. I said, yeah, no problem. What do you need? He's like, um, Matt needs a place to live for a little bit, you know, for a couple months till we were able to get a house or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, you stay with me, no problem. He said, well, it's a good answer because he's going to bring the Modified with him and you're going to run it at Bowman Gray. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> so that was a dream come true and, and I never would have had that opportunity to run Modified there. And That was the orange and white car? Yeah, okay. orange and white car. And uh, so that was in 06. So I basically took my guys off of my um, Pro Cup team, which were all just, you know, family or uh, friends of, you know, around home and from the late mile stock car team. We showed up to Bowman Gray and as an unknown, like, where'd you come from? Why are you here? You know, and because Bowman Gray is kind of mainstream now, but in 06, it really wasn't. Because I remember when I first started working with Ryan Priest, them guys up north, they wanted to hear Bowman Gray stories because they didn't, you know, never seen it. They've only heard of it. Right. You know, so uh, drove the car in 06 for Scott and uh, – then Matt moved to, to switch to Georgia Tech. So uh, the car went back up north, and then I actually bought it from Scott to run again in 08 because it was a good sponsorship program because, I mean, everybody knows the stadium, you know, draws in 12, 13, 14,000 people a weekend. And um, I did really good in T-shirt sales there every Saturday night. Like, you know, you could do T-shirt sales that cover the tire bill, you know. So, really? I mean, it was – um there was nowhere else you know that you could race around home that had that type of atmosphere it was it's electric yeah. i've never seen any type yeah. of that has the same energy that you would see at a, a packed cup race yeah you, you know and they have their when they treat you like a cup driver there of the fans um oh you're treated like it, a celebrity yeah because i mean you are you know and uh uh that that group of people and the fan base at Bowman Gray is second to none. And um, you, you can prove it after the race when you're selling T-shirts, you know. I mean, it's it's, it's good. So it was a good sponsorship program, and, and I hate that's where it ended. 
you know but it was a good place to end it though the racing there however is yeah nothing like anywhere else in the country i mean these guys have no problem with destroying their shit you know just to get back at somebody yeah and i couldn't <laughs> play that game because like you know it's so much work and so much money to put these things back together some of that stuff's not really understandable Oof. uh but it's uh it's a different game you're playing a different game there than you do anywhere else and you know there's entertainment uh, obviously but comes part of it and that kind of thing and every person's different what with their sponsorship program and the people that helps them get to the racetrack and sometimes that um um uh, it goes that way you yeah. know do, do i agree with all that and, and bowman gray is a tough place to race at because like i remember the very first time that i legitimately passed somebody like i was stoked inside the car <laughs> because you i remember it's... one night I, I rode behind bobby hutchins one night uh I think it was into 150 and beat his back bumper off and I, it was nothing against him he was pissed off at me too for for that but like i'm just trying to pass somebody you know because it is so freaking hard to pass without wrecking them and uh you know we probably run ninth or tenth or something like that and he's, he's probably like who's this guy beat my back bumper off trying to pass me for ninth you know and uh um, but it's just trying to pass because it's so hard to pass it. it's unbelievable it, it looks a little easier now the new track Mm -hmm. is is i don't know that this year the surface is really good it redid it um i don't know the exit of turn two looks like to me you got a little bit more room to work with mm -hmm. you know because you see guys been able to turn down underneath so um maybe it's going to be better you know it's kind of like the old bristol where you you know bump and run you had to knock somebody out of the way maybe you can race a little bit better now but it's back then just, you could it's it's an anomaly i've never seen a place like it before uh, um you know y there's a few places that kind of have that kind of vibe to it like islip speedway had that vibe back yeah. in the day it did you had your heroes you had your your villains you, you know they they loved don howe and they booed tom baldwin or they you know they loved bob park and they they booed whoever you know yeah. it was lou hennessy or whatever guy they didn't like it was crazy yeah um but just to race there, I think it was Jason Myers that said the most difficult and most frustrating part about Bowman Gray is having a great car and not being able to do anything with it. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a – so I always run part-time. In 06, I was running Pro Cup full-time, so I'd only go to the stadium when I didn't have a Hooters Pro Cup race. So I never could get in a rhythm of running three, four, five weeks in a row. Now, I said back then there's no way I'd pull my hair out if I raced here every week, but to get – accomplish something out of it and to be able to have opportunities to win races you play in the long game there you know you need to be there every week um you know and and because you know you might go some weeks where you don't pass a car and the next thing you know you um you know qualify up front or to me the madhouse scramble is the absolute best handicapping system for short tracks to run twin features and where Which they explain that to the one to the viewers that don't know yeah so the madhouse scramble on uh nice to have twin features for the modifieds they uh you qualify straight up for the first race so the to me the guys that have the fastest cars the guys like tim brown burt myers you know that's that's put in the time and effort to be the best guys that's ever been over there they get their opportunity to qualify up front to to knock off that win but then they'll go in victor lane and they'll pull a, a 6 8 10 12 14 16 chip and they'll invert that for the second race um you know so it might put an underdog or a low budget guy or a rookie or uh you know a veteran that hadn't won in a while that you next thing you know he pulls the uh the chip to, to start on the front row that night and they're going to try to capitalize on it so uh uh, it gives somebody a shot yeah and i think yeah. that the twin features have only been swept just a couple times in in history so it's very rare that it's you know uh for one guy to win them both so most of the time it has two teams leaving happy two fan bases two right. sponsors uh that's leaving happy so two it's the, winners and two winners and then you know it gives your opportunity to uh, because in late mile stock car racing through my tenure you know especially like even at hickory you know our regular show was a 50 lapper every friday night you started straight up from qualifying mm -hmm. so your fastest guys would start up front and they'd usually finish up front you know and uh, but doesn't that suck i'm i'm not a huge fan of that i'm not a fan of putting the fastest guy on the pole and letting him take off and it becomes a parade yeah and i i don't know i mean back then it it worked you know and i i think that um they're still good enough racing back then that that that, that wasn't a story back then because nobody talked about that nobody said it sucked and because 
at Hickory, we didn't have guys that, that – won 10 12 14 races a year or whatever you know i mean there's most of the time your champion would win you know three four five six races or something like that so it was still super competitive but as a rookie in 1995 racing against all the guys i mentioned earlier if we ran into the top 10 it was an accomplishment you know because they were starting 24 cars a week uh you know and and really really good guys you know a lot of veterans a lot of fast guys uh and then you see the the fields at races like that like weekly racing is in such peril nowadays you know it's you know it's good to see places like you know so i'm a big obviously you know work a ton of races a year from you know short track stuff as well as all my cup stuff and that kind of thing but i watch a ton of races on streaming um that's really the all we do for entertainment during the week i love midweek races uh because i'm able to to watch them you know but we watch a ton of dirt um you well, know, one of the and, things that I like about you, though, is that you can pull from, you can pull information from cup races or from your Saturday night short track, you know, because you're, you're there. Like, I yeah. know, I've seen it firsthand. You know, you've been at the k and races, late model races, modified races with Priest, uh, you know, and then you're up in the tower at, at a cup race. So I, I give it to guys like you because you're able to see all of those levels and what's going on. Yeah, you gotta be you gotta be in touch with it. Like when I first started spotting, um, you know, my first job was with uh, JGR on a K and M program. Well, then we were at Mansfield for our uh, K and N race that happened to be a double header with the modified tour, and Logano was our teammate at uh, at JGR, and his spotter Joey Savali uh, was friends with the Priests. Uh, this kid Ryan Priest needs a needs a spotter. Can you do it? Um, or will you do it? And I'm like, well, yeah. At the time, I didn't even don on me as I got this spot job. I just figured that I spot for this K&N car. You would never think that you'd get asked to do something else. Well, then that race went really well, and, and Ryan's dad, Jeff, said, hey, um, can you, how many of these races do you think you can do? I'm like, Ryan. Which track were you at? We were at Mansfield, Ohio. Ohio, okay. Yeah, it was a doubleheader with K&N and uh, the Modified, Modified Tour, you know, and which was – you know, modified tour didn't branch out like that very much back then, so it was a big race. And I was at that race. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure I was at that race. Yep. Uh, who was it that won? Was it uh, Savali or Pitcat won it? I think. Yeah, who I'm not it? sure. I remember the second year. I think TC won because we ended up. I think we run second or third the next year. But the that first year is the year you're talking about. You know, and uh, next thing you know, next. Jeff flies me up to Stafford or Thompson next. You know what I mean? So then I started broadening my thinking on how this could work for me as a business how cool you was know? it for you to be able to go and visit these tracks because i'm sure you've must have heard about them and read about them in stock car and now it was getting... a dream come true like the very first time that I, I walked into stafford you know and like um i was kind of like people hey uh hey i'm mike herman and, you know where you're from down south I'm like yeah he's like what are you doing here you know what I mean? On the spot for Priest, you know? And, like, that was kind of unheard of back then, too. So it was kind of, you know, forging a new path, you know? And now there's, a you know, a ton of guys that would be considered professionals that, that do what I do and on the modified tour. But I got to go to a ton of places that um, I never dreamed that I'd have the opportunity to go to. You know, and there's a lot of places that I miss. Stafford's now, gorgeous. You know. Thompson is gorgeous. You can't beat the side by side racing at Seekonk. I, yeah. I mean, the way that that place is shaped, I, there's just so yeah. many good racetracks up there and fast ones too. I mean, Thompson, you've been there. The place is lightning fast. Yeah, you know. I mean, yeah, I've Thompson. Heard... I mean, there's nothing. I hate to see that Thompson don't doesn't have a robust weekly program. But back to the streaming thing, that if I'm going to watch a, a race, an asphalt race, and I'm an asphalt short track guy to the core. But entertainment pound for pound dirt racing nowadays is like is really doing good. I oh mean, it's entertaining. God. Yeah. But like, if I can tune into Stafford, it, like they got a show. You know they what do. I mean? It's 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 really it's really good, and uh, I love Stafford. I think it's probably the perfect short track in in my mind. You know, and I, uh, if I'm a driver that is also a team owner, or I've got a team, uh, if I'm trying to woo a sponsor, 
and I live up in that area, the track that I'm taking them to is Stafford. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, but just with the sound system, the way that they do the yeah. show, the calls in the corners and the tele... They even put televisions in the urinals. Yeah. I mean, you know, name me another track that's trying to improve your pee experience. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and that's like, um, you know, going back to Bowman Gray, you know, Bowman Gray being a public facility like it is and and the renovations that they did there is like a premier short track i mean from the bathrooms concessions and that kind of thing so stafford is the exact same way and then you add in that stafford has real badass racing you yeah. know it's not so much circus style like bowman gray is you know so uh stafford is is it's the perfect short track and then like you compare Nowadays, obviously, living in Kannapolis, we got a new stadium for the Cannonballers, and so big minor league baseball fan go to was it Cannonballers games the last two games. So that's the benchmark is minor league facilities nowadays, mm-hmm. and you see very few short tracks that are trying to keep up with what minor league baseball gives the fans as far as facilities go. And then it's it's refreshing to see places like Stafford that that can rival any minor league experience and and so you know when you go there you're going to have good food you're going to have clean restrooms uh you're going to have micro breweries that are there selling you know their beers uh uh handicap ramp areas accessible uh, you know platform areas that are accessible and that's the type of things that that those tracks need to do uh you know one of the funniest things i remember about bowman gray the the old field house you you probably remember it going to the bathroom at bowman gray (laughs) you open the window and you watch the cars go by you're standing there at the urinal (laughs) i mean up close and personal yeah and that was like in 06 is when they had uh i think that was when they had tore the field house down so i got so many regrets from my career i did not get a photo of me and a modified on track at Bowman Gray with the old field house because it was gone that oh. year. And then the next year I run in 08 was when the new field house had been built. So I do have photos with it, mm-hmm. but there was nothing like the old field house. I mean, it was uh, just kind of iconic because you go back and look at 50 years worth of pictures and you see that field house, you know, uh, in those pictures so much. So, uh, hate it's gone, but what they've got now with the new, new field house is incredible, you know. You know, uh, um, talking about you know all this stuff too we're talking about things from years gone by things from today what about longevity in this sport Uh, like how does someone keep longevity whether it's as a driver a spotter like i mean your your dad has been in the sport for a long time you know and and he was more behind the scenes Mm -hmm. uh you drove and all that but like what do you think people have to do nowadays to keep that longevity in the sport because we're seeing that it's harder and harder than ever to stay in the sport for the people who want to yeah you know i think it's a it's a path that you forge for yourself you know and i think it boils down to like reputation and and what you bring to the table um you know unfortunately with the sport has changed some and and you know our the cup teams are don't don't employ as many people as they used to so there's a lot of good mechanics and fabricators that's you know to no fault of their own have have had to move on to other industry and and do different things and then i've seen um i've seen other guys that have come and gone just because of their personality you know because like we literally um traveled together like a circus for so many weeks of the year that the cup series is such a grind nowadays with only one weekend off and um you know um one big one is there's no saturday night races hardly anymore we only have like two uh, and then you, we got all the late starts on Sundays at, you know, three o'clock green flag. So, you know, back when we, you know, started at one o'clock, you'd be home by, you know, eight, nine o'clock, have dinner with the family. And now it's like, you know, midnight, one o'clock when you get home on a regular basis. So the cup series is such a grind that, um, you know, that I say that like in a cup series, like in, in America, like our best of the best is in the military. You know, that's that's our best of the best. And then cup racing is similar because these are superhuman people. It's just, it's really a garage full of really good people. You know what I mean? That mesh together, that can travel together and uh, to live cohesively and work together. Um, it's just, it's a, it's a unique, it's a unique thing. And as much as we travel and, and traverse the country doing this it's you got to be uh you got to have a good personality and get along well what about 
guys that are spotters, like being uh, having longevity as a spotter in the sport, you've had it for a while. I mean, you have a you know reputable name, but like just being able to stay, you know, in that position or stay employed. Yeah, you know, it's uh, um, it's about what you put into it. You know, and uh, you got to put forth a, a ton of effort. You got to go the extra mile. You got to be able to evolve. Um, you know, the because our job has continued to evolve. Uh, the things that I was talking about doing earlier, um, six seven years ago, um, in Cup, I didn't hear nothing out of my team until Thursday when we got to the to the airplane. You know, and uh, now I'm. You know, I go to uh, two or three meetings a week. Uh, the third meeting is kind of fluid uh, um, whether or not we're able to do it, but we have a post-race and a, a pre-race meeting that, that we go to, you know, and um, there's a lot of other guys that, that don't do that and a lot of other guys that, like, you know, um, they're not going to. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? That they That's not what they signed up to do. So you have to be willing to evolve with all those things and to, to be part of the team and what can you do to make this team better? You know, what can I do? To help my drivers be the best that they can possibly be and you know it's like if if you're building a perfect race car if you can mount two engines on this on this race car you'd want two motors right mm -hmm. you know and and it's the same way with like two brains you know like when i'm watching smt trying to pick out things that we can do better on the racetrack that's two people because driver you know they're looking at the same stuff and then i might see something that they didn't see and and to be able to um you know maximize what we do on the racetrack so it's all those things that that you put together and then if you bring value to the table you're going to you're going to last in this sport what are some of the things that are your pet peeves about spotting we chatted before you we wait well we went on air and um you were like you know you're not going to hear a show here you're yeah. not you know but what are some of the things that that just set you off or get you mad or you don't is a no-no for you <laughs> well you know it's like you're, you're 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 smiling right yeah, now. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's, I'm pretty by the book. I'm not, you know, like if you listen to our radio, it's uh, it's all it's all professional. You know, you're not going to hear cussing and screaming and yelling and not, you know, and and the, some of the meltdowns that guys have. You know what I mean? Because you know, they do have meltdowns. They do have meltdowns, and and like, I'm sure that I probably could, you know, go off when I drove and and you know push that button when I didn't need to push it I'm sure because I was probably hot-headed too but I've learned you want to learn each year you know what I mean so I'm 48 years old now so I hope that I've learned and matured over the years so uh, you know I want our radio to be really professional I want your kids to be able to listen to us mm -hmm. and you know I want that this type of kid that's going to listen to us really get into the nuts and bolts of how this race is playing out and um, every word that I say over the radio is going to be important. There's going to be a reason behind it. There's no bullshit with it. You know, it's going to be pertinent information, you know, to be able to help the driver and the team go as fast as they can possibly do to maximize this race. So, uh, you know, a lot of the color and stuff that you hear on the radios and stuff like that, it's just not my style, you know. So, you know, that's one thing. And then, um, you know, I'm, I'm a behind-the-scenes type of guy, Um like I said, I never intended on doing this. I would have been perfectly fine, or it's what I wanted to do was to be a short track racer. Unfortunately, in asphalt short track racing, and I had always said that if I hadn't made it to NASCAR by the time I was 30, that I was going to go dirt late model racing. And that was before dirt late model racing was even as big. I just, coming from my karting background as a dirt, you know, go kart racer, because, you know, I'd won some races on asphalt and road course and had run some indoor races, things like that. But, like, I was, at its core, I was a, a dirt cart driver. You know right. what I mean? Dirt racing was, was what I wanted to do. So, I guess that some peers that I had raced with had went on and, and had run, you know, dirt late model stuff. And so then when 30 come along and I hadn't made it, um, still things, there was, there's still hope. You know what I mean? Or there was hope that, that funding would continue on to where you could continue asphalt short track racing. And then next thing you know, I missed the boat on that. So I didn't, I didn't get to go dirt late model racing, you know, and, um, they're all younger than ever now yeah. to coming into the sport. <clears throat> Excuse me. That was actually going to be my next question. What is, uh, being a late model guy, what is your current take on the, uh, the world of late model racing? 
Do you think there's too many rules? Do you think we need some unified rules? I mean, we've we've got. We definitely need unified rules. I mean, when I go and look at it, and I've mentioned dirt racing here several times, or whatever the. Uh, you couldn't go and and duplicate what dirt racing does because it is so different than what asphalt racing is. But I think that they could go and learn and pick some of the things that do work. The run a show at a at a dirt late model race or a sprint car race or a midget race right now is so far superior from an entertainment standpoint that they did hit it and it's what they've always done it's just now we're getting to actually to see watch it. it on tv and see it but you know with uh when you roll hot laps and then um qualifying and heat races and a dash and a cba in the way it's broken up and you get to see the stars of the show uh you know like the guys that i pull for dirt late model racing and that's one reason why i like dirt late model racing because i'm not a dirt late model guy so i can be a fan you know okay. what i mean i can have guys i pull for mm-hmm. and like Dennis Herb Jr. and Mike Marler, those guys, like if if I would have got that opportunity when I was 30 to go dirt late model racing, those are the guys I would have wanted to be. You know, the way their demeanor, their personality, the way they carry themselves. Because I'm, I'm a blue-collar guy that just uh, – Alan Downham that sponsored me for so many years, he would always tell me, man, lace those boots up. You know, because this guy, he wore – he was a businessman. He wore work boots. It didn't matter if he was going to a board meeting – or going out in the field to work that day, he wore work boots every day. And I took that mentality that, you know, the man that's helping me race laces his work boots up no matter what the situation right. is. And that's the way I'm going to do it on a racetrack. And those two guys I just mentioned, that's the way they do it, you know, and uh, uh, they're not flashy. They don't have huge money behind them and, and that kind of thing, but they go out there and they win races. So, you know, asphalt short track racing could learn from that but the point is is like when you're watching that show you get to see those guys throughout the night in different environments different style of racing whether mm-hmm. it's a heat race or the or the feature where with asphalt short track racing you know it's uh you know it's 150 one, one, yeah, lap race in the tire saving race nowadays and oh my you know God. and like I'm, I'm sorry but lately I, i've i love don't get me wrong i love late model racing but i have become so disenchanted with it lately yeah. because i see a lot of unle- unnecessarily lapsed tire saving. Yeah. With two to go, the leader gets dumped. One, yeah. one or two to go, the leader gets dumped. There's shit talking in the pits, a fight, and we've seen this episode over and over it's and ridiculous. over again. It is ridiculous. You're right. You know, and, um, you know, when I do work short track races, sometimes I have to be involved in that stuff. And like the tire saving race, you know, those type of races, I'm. I'm one of the guys that's helped engineer that, you know, but we're just doing what we have to do to uh, under but, the rules given to, to maximize it. But it is not the greatest. But not say your driver's leading, watching. right? You get the white flag, you go down into turn three, second goes dive bombing in the corner, yeah. cleans you out coming out of four, and he gets the win. I mean, yeah. what, you know, obviously I, you want to kill somebody. Yeah, I mean, I, think I would. That, I think that one of the biggest things that, like, with asphalt racing is, is like, nobody, even the best guys, like, uh, um, you know, Bubba Pollard and, you know, obviously I work with Ty Majeski a lot, you know, um, you know, when Ty was running in Wisconsin all the time, they raced a ton, you know, and then like when you go to Wisconsin, they do race with respect up there, you know, and it's, it's really super clean and that kind of thing because I think because those guys do race so many races up there. Well, now in the South and, you know, no matter what series you run is only like, 10 11 12 races you know and then you might okay i might run this series and run this series uh and weekly racing is there's hardly any weekly tracks anymore you know it's all about touring you know and there's so many different tours and series that you can run that the best guys you don't see run weekly very much anymore so the dirt late model guys they race so much four or five times a week sometimes that they can't go over there and run over the guy because you got to race with him the next night Mm -hmm. where in in asphalt racing you you know there are usually big shows that only happen once every couple weeks or once a month or something so there's too much these guys don't get to race it still doesn't make it right to do it though you know the laying the bumper on somebody no what i'm saying is if if these guys had to run 100 races and they had to race the next night Mm -hmm. against that guy they wouldn't they couldn't do that you know what i mean they couldn't destroy their equipment the way they do uh it's just that the way it's set up nowadays you know it's uh um it can get stupid what are some of the biggest changes you've noticed that yourself in the last 
just 10 years of being around the world of racing just with between the drivers coming up the driving styles the lack of respect you know well the drivers are a lot of us who got younger um you know so now um you know I spotted for William Solowich at, at Martinsville uh, the other day in his debut, and I think he's like 16 years old, mm-hmm. um, you know, making his first truck start, did a great job. Uh, he's uh, he's definitely a prospect. But when I was 16, back to Junior Limited Modified, I was still racing go-karts. Like, right. stock car racing wasn't even, that wasn't even nothing a 16-year-old even thought about, right. you know, until you were 18, 19, 20, 21 years old. So the, the kids have obviously have gotten younger. Um you know the the rise of um the bigger budgets you know and the amount of uh tools and resources and technology that's used in short track racing um has gotten out of hand you know because back when i was you know late mile stock car racing i mean we're still setting cars up with on grain scales with a string yeah, now they're know. going to pull down race. yeah you know, i mean so it's the the crazy. trickle down that's one big thing that the trickle down effect from cup racing is absolutely real in asphalt short track racing where in dirt now granted in in dirt racing there's a ton of technology and you know arrows involved and obviously shock technology and everything that they do um is prevalent it there as well but the cup technology trickling down into asphalt short track racing has not been good you know it's this evolved so much to where your typical um typical average joe maybe a mechanic at the local dealership or whatever you can't just put a late mile stock car together to go run the cars tour or, or even the hickory with right. the amount of rules and everything that you got to conform to and the specs are so much tighter nowadays than what they used to be um you know it's just hard in other words it's it's if you're going to be good at this you have to be a professional and you have to do it full time all the time so it's 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 made it where the hobby racer has got pushed out of sport and that's sad and late model teams have actually become businesses yeah you know they they are the super teams you know and it and i'm part of it as well because like you know when i get hired to go to the racetrack to to work with a team i mean you know um back when when i was racing just like i was talking about lambert a minute ago he's just my buddy spotting for me you Mm -hmm. know what i mean and then uh um you know now it's you know evolved into where it's an important part that if you're going to go short track racing that if you have the ability to hire professional help to be able to come with you and that's either whether it's a crew chief or a spotter uh tire specialist you know that that's how you can win is to bring professionals so in other words you're not there's no teams of just your buddies learning how to do this anymore and no and, there and, isn't you know so it's just it's evolved into you know no fault of anybody it's just evolved that's you know what though that what sucks though i think it has taken a lot of the fun out of it too because when i moved down here and started racing down here compared to being up north when my brother and and you know and i were running like street stocks at riverhead or the midgets with my dad like we had our friends they would come over they'd work on the car we'd hang out together and then on the weekend we would go see the fruits of our labor what we could do to perform yeah you know and it was fun we all got together and we did it now down here i'm working on the car by myself in the shop nobody comes by if yeah. i need someone to come by i gotta pay them yeah like if i go to the track i'm going to the track by myself if i win it's by myself there's no one to celebrate with yeah. so it's like you know like why i it, that type of the fun of it has kind of fizzled out and it has and like when i moved on from running weekly at concord and like at 98 i run concord full time but we traveled a bunch too if there was a friday show at tri-county or a sunday show somewhere we traveled a lot and that was part of my sponsorship package too that we were needed to go to all these different markets and that kind of thing but um when i started running more races like that it was more workload than what my volunteer guys could do so um uh, a fellow named ray thies I had met him at Concord, but he was a professional. Um, Ray Thies from up north. Ray Thies? Yep, okay, him. yeah, so, yeah, I know who he you is. You know, he come over. He built race cars. Absolutely, yep. and he, he's a master fabricator and um, just an all around great guy. He's just smart guy. He's professional, mm-hmm. and he come over and offered to help. And when your volunteer guys, the workload was more than what they could help volunteer at you know two three hours a night. 
so uh, Ray would come over to, to my shop at night after, I think he was at Bahari at the time, on the cup team at Bahari. Um, and he would come work at night. So I couldn't nowhere near afford a full-time crew chief to work on my race cars every day, all day. That was me. I fortunately was able to, to do it all the time. But, um, you know, I'd hire Ray. And so you'd pay him, you know, um, whatever per hour to come over and help. And next thing you, know, you realize, you start seeing the value in a professional. Right. Or what he can get done in the time frame that he can do it because this is what he does for a living. So then when you hire one guy like that, it leads to another guy like that and leads to another guy like that. And then your volunteer guys that um, maybe have other careers that's not wanting to be, you know, in NASCAR full time, they kind of – start stepping aside and then next thing you know you're you're everybody on the race team's paid you right. know and i think that that would be it would point to reason why there's no reason why short track racing talking about stafford we should have a stafford right here and that mm -hmm. should have been concord now concord's plowed over nothing you know and and talking about facilities you know uh, Hickory Motor Speedway is a home track of mine. Uh, I'm looking forward to going back there in, uh, I guess, two or three weeks to spot for Majeski in the Super Race, and I hadn't been back in a long time. And unfortunately, I know it hasn't changed any since I was there. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the same bathrooms, the same, you know, in other words, there's been nothing invested in that. And it should be a showpiece for NASCAR short track racing, you know. So there's no reason why that our area here around Charlotte should be the hotbed of short track racing. And it's not like the biggest thing we got going is Millbridge with with micro sprints, and you know, all carts. Yeah, yeah, you know. So I mean, it's um, it's a shame. But so, but maybe up in places like Connecticut or Wisconsin, where they don't have that eight hundred pound gorilla of NASCAR Cup racing sitting on top of it in the area. Unfortunately, that must be the reason why that short track racing is not big around here is just because of the trickle down from from Cup. Yeah, I think it's going to get to a point where it's going to cost so much to race that we're under. We're going to end up going back to the junkyards to yeah. find our stuff. I really, I do. Th I think it's going to get to that point because the cars, the engines, ever they're all so damn expensive now. Yeah. We're going to get to a point where we got to go to the scrapyard to to get our stuff and back yeah, and back to running that, like street stocks again. <laughs> unfortunately, that scrapyard is going to be co part and our racetracks are going to be underneath them. Yeah, so, I know, right? uh, you know, we're not going to have places That's left what, to race. That's what the third track that they've uh, bowled yeah. over or something like that. Yeah, and I know they're they're obviously have targeted um, you know, short tracks is is a place to where we can go get a, a, a big a piece of land that's zoned correctly to be able to do this. So, um, wow. you know, it's like it's a target, you know, and what do you do about it? But the biggest thing you can do is like go support your local tracks, and Absolutely. hopefully, when you go support your local tracks, hopefully the promoter supports you as a fan and gives you amenities, and and the racers, you know, know that they're uh, carrying the torch for guys like me and uh, that don't get to race anymore. That hopefully the sport, you know, continues on. But it's going to look different each and every year. Yeah, we got to wrap it up soon. But before we get going, uh, two things that I wanted to talk to you about, and Dilner was prodding me about this. He told me he said, "Ask Herman about the story about the shortest night at the bar at the Dutch Inn." <laughs> <laughs> and and for uh, those who are tuning in, the Dutch Inn is the famous hotel not right down the road from Martinsville. Yeah, you know, so the Dutch is obviously is legendary in the uh, in the world. I mean, you know, whether it's. Uh, guys from late mile stock car racing that's telling stories about the dutch and then you go up north to a modified race and the modified guys are telling stories about the dutch back then and you know so we were at at martinsville running a late mile stock car race at, at and we were staying at the dutch i i think it was the very first was it time the I'd big ever, 300 lapper it was yeah okay. and so it was we were, i was staying at the dutch my team was and uh you know so get in from the track that night and you, you go down to the flying dutchman to the bar and um you know one of my best friends he he didn't want to go but his uh girlfriend did so me and a couple other friends and we go to the dutch so we go into the bar and it's packed completely packed wall to wall in there and we're just kind of walking our way down through the through the bar well some guy that had obviously had too much to drink you know felt my friend up so as, as soon as he touched her, I laid him out. So then when I laid him out, it, it just it chaos ensued. Well, my engine builder, 
uh, Charlie Morris was sitting on the other side of the bar, and like he's an old school guy. He's like, ah, he's a fight. And he looks up. He's like, oh, it's my driver. You know what I mean? And so we, we literally we went in one door and right out the other. You know what I mean? Is we were wasn't in there one minute, and then so <laughs> no I get, drinks, I, nothing. Nah, nothing. And I got up to the room. I was rooming with my dad. He's like, "Well, you wasn't going very long." Yeah, I said, "Yeah, wasn't much going on down here. It's kind of quiet at night." So we decided to just uh, come on back. So yeah, that was a that was a quick night at the Dutch. But there's some oh legendary stories come out of that place. You know, I, I know I heard uh, a lot of, over the years. Richie Evans chainsawing a hole in the, the yeah. wall to make adjoining rooms and. Yeah, uh, one of my heroes, and I won't mention his name, but there's a, a guy that I raced with in late mile stock car racing and some other stuff that I like. He's a he's a legend to me. I remember going in there one night, and he's just laid out on the on the dance floor like he's out cold. Out, <laughs> and, and the party's going on around him or whatever. Like he must be fine or whatever. I'm like, what's he doing laying on the floor? And you know, it's did just, he have to race the next day? Oh yeah, and he'd, <laughs> and he'd do it well. You know what I mean? He didn't. You didn't have to worry about him. He's going to be up front. Bunch of partiers though. Yeah. Uh, you know the. Fun funny thing is is that that party and kind of still has transferred over to uh uh mill hill stadium yeah uh, and uh I, I have been there before i think the place is great uh, and for people that don't know explain everybody what mill hill stadium is uh well i've got an rc racetrack at my house and it, it's all it's basically temporary even though it's permanent but it's you know i've got a a, a large piece of concrete between my house and a race shop we did a tv you know, feature yeah, on it on yeah. speed sport and i uh, you know i decided i was gonna well some guys i spotted with it was you know spotters they kept talking about rc racing you know and i thought it was kind of silly you know and then until i did all this concrete work and i'm like i could build a racetrack here so uh david keith god rest his soul he uh he had RC race cars, and he come over to the house, and he literally we took a, a garden hose, I call it a hose pipe, we laid it out in a circle, and he's like he ran his cars around. He said, "Man, this would be perfect," you know. And so we started uh, uh, between DK and Tony Rains and some other friends. We started building a building a uh, RC racetrack, and then I don't know how to do anything but right, you know. So we just went all out on it to kind of. Uh, build a track at my house i'm like if you know i don't get to race anymore but i can i can do this and, oh it's badass you know and uh the wall the red and white walls yeah. that you guys have it's, it's i'm awesome. kind of a promoter at heart you know what i mean like if you know <laughs> i've always wanted to promote or you know run a racetrack and i'm like well i do it here you know what i mean i can do it the way i want to do it i can uh, run my show the way i want to run it and design my race format the way i want to do it and and try things that i have ideas with and, and it's uh, gotten big yeah you know you guys get tons of, of guys that show up to race yeah and not uh, only that but we had a ton of people that just would come and watch you know i mean i think i counted one night me? 65 70 people <laughs> that would just show up just to watch you would have 15 20 guys that were racing and Dillner on the mic, Freddie Kraft was race director and that kind of thing. And Dillner uh, announces, Dillner, and yeah. Dudes does the national anthem, yeah, which so we, I think was hysterical. Yeah, we wanted it to be fun to watch. You we know, we got to have dudes on the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You definitely have to have. He's a he's a character. He's uh he's a good friend of mine, and uh he's uh he's something else. It's it's great. He's he's a great guy. But listen, we got to wrap it up. But I want to thank you for coming in today. I mean, I'm sure you've got hours of stories more that you could tell us but we definitely appreciate you coming in today would you come back yeah absolutely I, I there's still more to when you've been at it as long as i've been at it and you get this gray hair or whatever there's still more stories to tell always well we thank you for coming in you know dillner told me to have you come in because you'd be a great episode and you know we've been friends for a while and uh I, I feel like we can just sit down and chat like like buddies yeah it's fun i like to bench race you know i mean it's uh that's part of what our sports about the camaraderie and and you know just sitting down and talking about the the past and the future thanks man yeah thank you brother. yeah you too buddy. all right mike herman joins us on the derek pernasiglio show I want to thank you all for joining us and we'll see you the next time bye <laughs>